the first to know in SMPTV. Memamo, akwa babi mba in SMPTV so. E the ongoing ambulance trial a efa eye. Ye wa kese ato forcing awe de minority leader. Ene, a ono ane say the first accused efa eye ambulance case we mo. Ene, Richard Japa, a ono say the third accused. Nene, court ko asit na ne, insem mebe na ne ECC wo court wo. Na the aftermath of court ruling no. Na hono na ene, lawyer po adumo che enya bre no din semi bre na to ja e de dramatic cross examination of e Richard Japa awe de third accused no ene abra Richard Japa e ku shia e ye director of public prosecution even atakura obo obisane de ene one ne lawyers e fambu ye pa o court wo a Richard Japa cross examination no one ne lawyers e de bre wo mu ye pa o court wo mo na mi se be pi Mese sebe kone kuti lawyer po adumoche Nsema odi tu dwa abra Oma eye Weti japa Ene ne lawyer se se di Eni su adani su Ene ewo oma kachi Yonko Yonko te lawyer po adumoche Nsema odi tu dwa So it's Our big take away from the court Where we were this afternoon Is as follows One Mr. Japa says he was victimized in the army And that is why he failed his promotional exams Several times And that is why the army said He had bad conduct uh, number two says he claims Kulendi went all the way to AG's office during the court's proceedings to ask the AG to help Jakpa to go home due to uh, complications in the verification of the documents. And the third one we add is a text messaging, the story about the text messaging, which I've already said. So three stories. Let's begin with the first one. Uh, uh, Francis Jakpa says he was victimized. Uh, he said that in cross-examination today, uh, being cross-examined by uh, the director for public prosecutions uh, representing the prosecution in the matter of the ambulance trial with uh, case law to force in the minority leader uh, as the first accused person. Second accused person has been discharged by the court upon the discretion of the attorney general as a result of ill health, proving ill health. And the third accused person is Mr. Francis Jackpa, who was an agent for a company called Big C, which was contracted by the government of Ghana, blah, blah, blah. The subject matter of the contract is before Her Lordship Justice Efia Sewa. Now, though, let's get to the details. Here, Jackpa says, according to records, he didn't pass his promotional exams from 2000 to 2007. He answered that he was being victimized. What is the story behind the victimization? Mr. Jackpa says that uh, his father... Uh, had something to do with the defense of the revolution. In, in particular, his father had something to do with the release of Fly Lieutenant Rawlings. I believe he may be referring to the uh, interrogation between May 15th and June 4th. The June 4th coup that was occasioned by Boatijan, Mensapoku, and others uh, to release Fly Lieutenant Rawlings. And then uh, Fly Lieutenant Rawlings was due to go back to court, the court martial of the Ghana Armed Forces at Bema Hall on 4th June, Monday, 4th June, 1979. The court's trial had begun already. It was led... The tribunal was chaired by uh, Colonel Emisa uh, in those days. I believe the name is Emisa, yes. Colonel Emisa, who was the, um, the director of the directorate at the legal directorate of the Ghana Armed Forces. The director at the legal directorate of the Ghana Armed Forces, Colonel Emisa, I believe it is. Oh, no, i sorry. The name is um, uh, Enunfo. Colonel Enunfo. He was uh, the director, legal director of Ghana Armed Forces in 1979. He was a lawyer. Uh, they call him a judge advocate, something like that. So he was chairing, and then the the, the matter had been adjourned. Lawyers for Fly Left and Rollins included the famous William Abuduma, Bosman, Chachu Chikata, and others. We have that in some of our documentaries. The June 4th documentary is really there. You can Google it and look at it. So, JJ was due in court, back in court on Monday, June 4th. And then at the dawn of Monday, June 4th, uh, soldiers led by Captain Boachijan hit the BNI headquarters and released JJ Rollins. Mr. Jaguar is telling us a story that suggests that his father may have been instrumental in that operation. He says, as a result of that, he was victimized in the Ghana Armed Forces. And um, he said that having joined the Ghana Armed Forces in 1998, I believe, um, he had two years of his second lieutenant to lieutenant without any exam, which is what it is. And then from lieutenant to captain, you have to write an exam. It takes four years to be lieutenant to captain. If you pass your exam in four years' time, you'll be captain. Uh, it turns out that he had difficulties in passing the exam. The matter was confronted to him in court today because I think the prosecution is trying to unravel the character of the witness, the character of the accused person. I guess that's what the prosecution is trying to draw at. So they will draw at anything that has to do with your history, your career, your background, something like that. So the prosecution found this one quite useful, and, and rightly so. So they asked him questions about it. Then he says, oh, my father was JJ's man, so they were victimizing me. In fact, 
when I was graduating, I was a top marksman. And I was a top marksman and I was sent to the Reiki Regiment. Reiki Regiment at the time that he graduated had two bases, one in Sunyani uh, alongside the 3rd Battalion of Infantry and one in Accra alongside the 5th Battalion of Infantry. I think Reiki has one more right now. But for the longest time, those of us who grew up in Bemakam, Reiki was in Sunyani and in Accra. So Mr. Japa was sent to Sunyani and he said that as a result of his record in the military academy as a great marksman, Flight Lieutenant Rollins invited the Ghana Armed Forces to send him to Accra to be at Gonda Barras, which is the base of the Reiki Regiment in Accra. And uh, today, Reiki Regiment shares also with the 64 Infantry Battalion. So in that part of Bema Camp, at the end of Bema Camp, at the Arakan Mess, beyond those of you who go and do sports, beyond the sports center, there are three important units of the Ghana Armed Forces, the Reiki Regiment, the 64 Infantry Battalion, and the headquarters of the 5th Battalion of Infantry. They are all up there. Now, Mr. Jagba is saying that JJ brought him over to Accra. Perhaps so that he'll be nearer JJ. I don't know. I'm not sure why they didn't put him in the uh, 5064 Infantry Battalion. But this is the catch. The guy's uh, difficulties in the promotional exam included when JJ was president. Here. JJ, his man, was president in the year 2000. Then came John Kufo. He told the court and mentioned the name of Kwame Adoku for the defense minister. Mentioned the name of uh, General DJB Dankwa, the chief of defense staff at the time. Uh, in connection to his difficulties. And he says that as a, because he's a Rawlings man, when the Kufo people came, they didn't want him promoted. But his first uh, examination difficulty was in 2000 when JJ was president. So I'm not so sure. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what the court will look at it, what the value they will do. But I'm just raising this uh, question that sort of pop out when you look at the material. These things pop out. Guy says I'm JJ's man. My father was JJ's man. I'm JJ's man as well. JJ actually said they should bring me to Accra. During the period of JJ, you take a promotional exam from lieutenant to captain, and the people say you have failed. JJ was president. Why did you fail the exam? Oh, Kufu and his people didn't like me. They didn't like me because I'm JJ's man. Because I'm JJ's man, when Abu Kufu became final, a defense minister, he didn't want to see my face at all. He and JB Dankwa, they didn't want to see me. And so they victimized me. Okay, fair enough. That's a story. But the guy didn't pass in JJ's 2000. Ajakun Kufo was sworn in on 7 January 2001. By the time that Ajakun Kufo was sworn in, the guy had already failed one exam. And he continued to fail the other six. But the first one was under JJ. So, is it not, does it not sound incongruous? Anyway, that's it for now. Let's get to the second level of the argument. In the second level of the argument, uh, no, let's go back to the, the base before we come to this. The, the, fact, the question is the two takeaways. Let's, let's get there first. So it's fundamental and you can move on. Yes, thank you. Now, in the second level, we have a third level on the text message, but the second level of the argument, it says, Jackpot claims that Justice Kulendi went all the way to the Attorney General's office during court proceedings to ask the Attorney General to help Jackpot go home due to complications in the verification of documents used by Japa to secure bail. Now, this is the story, viewers. This, this is because the matter is in court. The only word I can use to qualify it is interesting. Ah, he says, Justice Kulendi, thank you very much for this. Justice Kulendi sitting as a Supreme Court judge on a panel of five. He's not sitting as a, a, a sole judge. And he's not sitting as an additional court of appeals. He's sitting as a Supreme Court judge. Panel of five. Yeah, he's not the only one on the panel. Five of them. Jaka told the High Court today that while Justice Kulendi was sitting there, he phoned Justice Kulendi and said that whereas he has satisfied bail conditions, it was still being difficult for the people to grant him the bail for him to go home. And he told the court, this also, viewers, please pay attention if you can. He told the court that Justice Kulendi, upon receiving his call, his Jaka's call, departed from the bench. He told the courts that Justice Kulendi was still robed in the legal way. Look at where the Supreme Court, those of you who don't live in Accra, the distance between the Supreme Court and the Attorney General's office on a weekday by driving is easily 25 minutes. That's the minimum. It could be 45. It could even be an hour, but it's easily 25 minutes. Jackpa told the court that the sitting Supreme Court judge, whilst sitting on the case, got a phone call from him, Jackpa, relating to the difficulties of his bail conditions. And the Supreme Court judge left the, the courts, drove to the Attorney General's office. Here we depict uh, Justice Kulendi and the Attorney General. My, my graphics guy, Katunga, is beautiful, man. That guy does a good job. You call him at 3 o'clock and say, 
Charlie, can you put a cartoon together? You don't have to say, my papa, 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 he'll do it. This is what he gave us. Beautiful, fantastic. So, Justice Kulendi comes to the Attorney General's office, sits down in this chair. This is the Attorney General with his legs crossed in a blue suit. And then, uh, please, you have to put a tie on Gofredami. He's always wearing a tie. He doesn't do the things that we are doing here. So, next time, Graphis, put tie on Gofredami, red tie, or some black and white Adisco tie. Kulendi tells Dami that arrange bail for my cousin Jakpa. He's still in the Supreme Court's robe. He climbs up to the third floor of the Attorney General's office, the old office, because, of course, there's a new office called the Law House. He climbed up to the third floor in his robe. This is what Jakpa told the court. I mean, if you are Jakpa's lawyer, my goodness, what will be going through your head? That the Supreme Court judge stopped the sitting room and left the floor, ran to the his car, went to the Attorney General's office and told him, Grant my cousin Jakpa bail. What do you make of this story, viewers? I don't know. The matter is still in court and is before. Next photograph. The matter is still in court and is before the judge. So this is Jakpa in there. This is Jakpa in there. And he's looking for bail. And he says that Kulendi, uh, he makes a phone call to Justice Kulendi, and Justice Kulendi stops his work. I mean, this is what he said. Just going to stop the work that he's doing. Hearing a matter before the Supreme Court, he is still in his red and black robe, goes to Attorney General's office. This is what Japa told the court today. We have nothing to say about it, just to say that it's very interesting. Very, very interesting. Anyway, now, the last part of Japa's testimony, which is the most bizarre, is what I told you about. Text messages are 68 68 text messages that he sent to the attorney general and the record should the attorney general reply two of the six eight he sent 68 messages attorney general replied two he was asking court that why do you, does it do you know can you confirm that many of the text messages you sent to the attorney general he didn't reply he replied only two of them which had to do with a schedule for you guys to meet then he says oh he didn't reply because the third person I say is motivational message. You are an accused person. Every morning you are sending a attorney general motivational message. Is he your friend? Is he your church member? What are you sending him motivational message? Do you go to the same church? Are you in the same fellowship? They, you uh, accused person, third accused. You claim that attorney general helped you secure bail. Every morning I send him text uh, motivational. I, I want to see some of those persons. Does it say so that? Uh, uh, give up not uh, don't despair move on to the next level if you fail you rise again good morning attorney general is that the thing he was doing is that guy a member of your church Mr. Zakwa, this is what he told the court this is what he told the court today this is the kind of witness we are dealing with the guy who can have a 26 minutes uh, phone call and produce only 14 minutes he has 68 messages he produces 25 how, why do you produce 25? That is my case. This is my case. I have to produce my own. This is my case. So the one, the other one is his case. So it's up to him. Me, I'm doing my case. I'm not doing his case for him. So the text messages that will exonerate him, I won't give it to the court. I will keep it to myself. The one that I think that the court will look at it and agree with me, I will give it to the court. So court, I have looked at all the 68. It's about 25 that are in my favor. So court, here, 25 gets... That's Jaqua. The same text messages are handed over to the NDC. So you see, I've been telling you that there are some good people in the NDC. When the NDC did a press conference, they were unaware that Jaqua didn't give them all until we came to show it here. So some of them were calling me and saying, I want the asset party to see the Jaqua thing. When Johnson said, look at it. So Jaqua, he deceived the NDC chairman and Samuel JV because he didn't give them all the text messages. They thought he had given them all. So the ones that we got, they didn't have. And that's what Jaqua confirmed to the court today. That he gave only 25 text messages out. The audio recording, he put out only 14 of 26 minutes. That's what he did. He picks and chooses. He's not interested in telling the court the whole truth. He's not interested. He's not interested in telling the court the whole truth. It would appear so. I hope he's interested. But it would appear that he's not interested. In telling the court the whole truth. I don't know. Maybe he is. Maybe he's not. But the way it looks, you have to decide, viewers. 
And I'm sure that his lordship will decide so that we all know. But uh, the way he does it, ah, well, what can you say? I don't know. I really don't know. You don't know whether you should believe him. You don't know whether you shouldn't believe him. But he says, court, take 25. That's fine. That's okay. Take the 25. Take it. It's fine. Then, <laughs> the attorney general now says, oh, you are giving the court 25. My lords, I want to bring all 68 so that the court can take the value of it. 68 is the whole truth. It's nothing but the truth. 68, the whole truth. Nothing but the truth. Then lawyers for Jakpa, we can't tell whether it's on the instruction of Jakpa or it's on their own instincts. We really can't tell because lawyers are usually working on the instructions of clients, but we don't know this one. What happened though is that lawyers for Jakpa come out and say, Judge, we will object to your taking the text message from the Attorney General. We will object. That's what, that's what the lawyer said. We will object. Now, what is the basis of the objection? Of, of the objection? Then one of the lawyers says that the text message, the typed document that the Attorney General is submitting is black and white. In text, some is green and some is white. Why is his own black and white? Viewers, you know the answer to the question that the judge gave? The judge said, ah, but you two, the one, the text message you brought, it was in black and white. So if yours was in black and white, why are you objecting to this in black and white? Then the, yeah, the guy says, well, the fact that we asked the black and white it was accepted doesn't mean that his own should also be accepted. Another lawyer said, that, okay, let me study it first. So the court held the matter down and said, okay, let them study it on Thursday. Let's, let's come and hear the objection. If there's no objection, we'll accept it. If there's an objection, we'll hear it and we'll rule upon it. This is what happened in court today. There'll be more on Thursday. But you have to remember that Mr. Jakpa says out of 68, he gives 25. He doesn't want to give the rest because to go against his case. Out of the audio recording, he gave 14. So he gave text messages to the NDC. NDC were not aware that it's not the whole thing. And then based upon that, they held a press conference. Okay, story has ended now, hasn't it? Yes, uh, 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 let's take text messages as I'm being back on to do.